Cynthia and Francois, I'm going to allow the two of you to introduce yourselves because you will sound, well, I should give you this at least, uh, the brilliance of this two team. We are excited to have them here because uh, as a dual working team, having worked both at the Bertha Center at the University of Cape Town, where they met, they have continued to work together over time. So if you want to go first, Cynthia, quick introduction. Sure. I'm just making sure that everyone can hear me. Mm -hmm. You're it's good. great to be here and I'm so happy to see so many of you coming in. We were just talking about what a wonderful group this is going to be. Um, so I'm Cynthia Rayner, co-author of the Systems Work of Social Change, Catalyst 2030 member. Um, and essentially we're, we're gonna talk about the history of the book and, and how it came to be. Um, but just a brief introduction, I'm an adjunct faculty member at the University of Cape Town Bertha Center for Social Innovation where I met uh, Francois Bonici, my co-author, and I currently have just relocated to Austin, Texas. So I've moved um, to the US side and I'm a researcher, a co-learner. Um, I work closely with social change organizations based on my history of working in nonprofit organizations in South Africa. And so a lot of this work comes from the experience that I had, but mostly uh, just my love of storytelling and my love of writing and really gathering stories from groups such as this. So thank you so much for being here. I'm, I'm very pleased and privileged to be here with you. Uh, uh, Debbie, uh, Julia, the whole Catalyst Secretary team and Drew who's here with us to, to kick us off. Uh, just to say thank you so much for the opportunity uh, to be here uh, as a proud Catalyst member, but also as uh, in some ways, a child of this whole movement. You know, I've been following social innovators and social entrepreneurs, been inspired by them, uh, have attempted to be one kind of unsuccessfully at some point in my career as well. Uh, and uh, just this is a, a special moment for us to be able to do what we've done in this journey, which is ask some questions around how we personally were stuck. And we're going to talk just now about um, why kind of why we're here today, but we actually wanted to start with why are you here today? So um, just a quick intro. So I'm, I'm Francois, I, I um, started the Bertha Center for Social Innovation in, in Cape Town. Actually this November 10 years ago, which is an exciting moment. I then moved on, I stay connected there as, a, as adjunct faculty like Cynthia. Um, I'm now uh, at the Schwab Foundation for Social Entrepreneurship that has had a long history of supporting social entrepreneurs, many of whom are in the capitalist movement um, and kind of at an intersection point of thinking about kind of systems change with a capital S, capital C and systems work with a, as you can see on the title, small s and small w. Uh, and we want to make that connection as well as part of this course, because I think many of you are kind of already engaged in this conversation. And so, you know, by no means do we have the beginning or the end of the answer on the story, but we wanted to bring forward, um, we thought it was very important messages from what practitioners were doing to that conversation. So delighted to be here. I see some familiar faces. So kind of hi to, to those of you who know well, really looking forward to uh, seeing more of you and getting to know more of you. Uh, some of you have already put uh, your uh, name and where you're from on the chat. We'd love to see more of that. And as you do that, um, also please rename yourself. I think most of you are appropriately named so we can see who you are. Uh, but also uh, just jot down in the chat why you're here today can just be a couple of words, one line. And while you're doing that, those of you who also um, are here, um, I'm just trying to look through everyone who's here, quite, quite a few people off video, that's totally fine. When we go into breakout groups, it will be obviously helpful for people to turn their videos on so that you can connect together. Great, thank you already for some of the answers. While others of you are writing, perhaps uh, Naida, if that's how I pronounce your name, or Naida Kulshaw, uh, you said here to expand your thinking around systems and the impact you can have. Can you expand on that a little bit and introduce yourself? We're not gonna have a chance to introduce everybody, but what we'll try and do is during yeah. the course of the, the module do that. Uh, sure, um, 
so expanding my thinking more because I'm connecting it to the research that I'm doing as a doctorate candidate um, at the school of where I also lecture so Grenoble Ecole de Management in France. And so my thinking around this uh, coming from uh, a community activist type background, nonprofit background is just mm -hmm. to make connections between my experience on the ground, mm -hmm. where this work can take that kind of work, but then also how that might show up in either pedagogy or approaches in developing social environments inside of higher education. So I've got a, a few links that I'm making here. Oh, that's Sounds like very much where we still are and have been and as part of our journey. So just delighted to meet you. Thanks for, for, Thanks. for jumping in. Um, uh, looking through some of the other uh, comments here and maybe I'm gonna pick on someone who hasn't commented necessarily or um, uh, so we can make sure we hear from everyone. Uh, and maybe Cameron is here as chair of the Systems Change Learning Working Group. It would be great, Cameron, for you jump in here and also share a bit more of what's happening in that group. You know, we're not uh, certainly, as I said, proposing to, to say we, we're capturing everything here, but we want to take people through the journey of uh, what we'd like to share. That's um, only just started. So the Australasian chapter is fairly new. Some of the working groups have had several meetings. The Systems Change Learning Group has only had one meeting so far. So we're still in the exploratory phase and thinking through what the focus will be. Thanks, Cameron. I know Debbie has also been uh, curating the predecessor or, or connected to, to, to that group. So uh, I know we're just delighted to be, you know, at the beginning of the journey of this learning group. So thanks again. All right, um, uh, I'm just great to read everything here. Um, do feel free to jump in um, with questions as we go, either on chat or just raise your hand. That'll be really helpful for us to be able to see because we can't always see everyone on the screen. And if you use the raise your hand function, then you certainly become visible to us if you're trying to, to jump in. Um, Cynthia, can I hand over to you to just, uh, or should we just, maybe you can go first around why, why we are here. So we wanted to be able to answer that question to you as well. We can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, I have a faulty um, set of headphones, it seems. Um, just, Francois and I wanted to kind of give you a little bit of background about how we came to write the book because we think this journey um, is is part of the, the the process that we're all going through of understanding systems change. Um, I think you know, looking through the the comments in the chat box, many of you are asking about what does systems change mean, coming here to learn about systems change. Um, for us, the, the term was a very um, fraught one, a very um, um, one that we, we didn't really fully understand when we started thinking through it. And we wanted to um, learn from practitioners. We wanted to learn from those who were doing systems change work rather than kind of sitting in conference rooms, um, in funder boardrooms and talking about it. We really wanted to see what was happening on the ground. And we were given the opportunity by the Schwab Foundation about six years ago to do work with about six different organizations that we identified as being systems changers to think about how they were working. And what we discovered was not what we expected to discover. Um, you know, most of these organizations were not sitting around mapping systems and figuring out perfect um, moments to intervene and designing perfect systems changing strategies. Um, instead, what they were doing was working in different ways on the ground with people and ensuring that people, primary actors who we'll talk about, were becoming the real heart of change. And as we saw this, we realized that many organizations were already doing this work. There were organizations that were coming from the traditions of activism, of community organizing, of social justice movements. And those were the organizations for us that were really shifting systems in ways um, that were very interesting and even in some ways very compatible with the world that we came from, which was a business school where social entrepreneurship and scaling was re were really the terms of the day. And we thought if these, if these two things can be blended, if, 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 if we can actually find a way to speak a language together, um, then we can really truly find what we mean by systems change rather than sitting in these um, kind of theoretical conversations about systems change. 
So it was born, the book was born out of frustration because with this term, we didn't understand, we didn't know how to do it. And really it was a journey of learning from people that were doing this work on the ground. Um, and essentially we're here as a voice for these stories. Um, you know, we're not here to say that this is the only way forward, but we're here to say that this is what the way we saw many organizations doing their work. And we suspect that many of the organizations that you represent are already doing a lot of this work as well. Okay, I think, you know, born out of frustration, but also out of failure. Uh, I think, you know, setting up a center for social innovation in a country like South Africa with its history, thinking that, you know, great solutions, quote unquote, are gonna solve some of these much deeper lying problems was, you know, a journey um, of, you know, of, of humility. Um, and uh, as, as Cynthia had said, you know, we learned a lot from, um, of the, the work of, of community organizers in, in this process. And there was this kind of blending that was happening. Uh, the other thing is, you know, as Cynthia said, we were quite felt that that global conversation around systems change was often being driven by actors of power. Um, and that actually, if we, if, if, if actors of power, are the ones that redesign systems, we might end up with different systems, but not necessarily with, uh, with different outcomes. Um, oh, and certainly not with different uh, areas of participation. So, I think the one thread that we'll make while a lot of this work speaks to the day-to-day -day work, and that's kind of why we refer to this as systems work, um, it does also connect to these larger arcs of change that people are talking about. So at some point I got very allergic to the term systems change because I, everyone is kind of using it in different ways and means different things. Uh, sometimes it means, you know, the big changes that we see every generation, 50 years, whatever it might be, and other people are talking about it as you know things that happen every day and so you know, I think the work we all need to do is is to is to be more articulate by what we mean we also risk diluting um, the ambitions for the step change in the way we do social change that I think everyone has an appetite and aspiration and a recognition for um, but that we actually need to focus on the work we do so that's the that's the kind of emphasis behind it all so thanks for the comments uh, Valeria and then uh, without further ado, uh, Cynthia, should we run through the um, agenda at least for today and then uh, over the three sessions? Yeah. Um, so, so we want this to be um, not, uh, not us as talking heads. We really want to give um, a set of frameworks and some language, but um, ultimately this is about having you in conversation with each other um, about the work that you are doing and about the work that you would like to do. Um, so we're going to start with an overview of the first three chapters of the book, which we'll go through in about 20 minutes, um, including a case study of an organization called R Labs. Um, then we're gonna ask you to do some independent journaling um, because we think that hopefully out of the, these, um, this case study, you'll have some opportunity to think a little bit about the work that you're doing and the systems work that you are already doing in your organizations. We'll do breakout groups because it's really important that we connect with each other. Um, that's how we learn together. And then we'll come back and we'll have some discussion together as well. Um, and then lastly, we'll go through the uh, last two modules that, and what we're going to be doing over the next two weeks together. So I'd like to just go ahead and kick us off and then I'm going to hand it over to Francois as well. We're gonna go through about um, 10, 10 slides together and then we'll jump into the case study. Um, I know that many of you were not able to access the book. We, we are trying to work on these issues of accessibility and we apologize for that. Um, but we're going to be talking to the, to the concepts in the book um, and you can, I, I think you'll definitely be able to follow along even if you haven't been able to do the pre-readings. Um, the, the book starts with a grounding in what we call an industry of social change. And the reason why we grounded it in an historical approach is because when we started doing our research, we realized that this term systems change is really an, an output of about 200 years of history, about 200 years of social change making that the world has been following. And really what happened, we found in the historical record was that social change in the first 100 years that we looked at was a very localized effort. Oftentimes it was very locally based, it was community based, and a lot of the social change efforts were based in the context in which they were trying to change things. That shifted very importantly in the post-war period, the post-World War II period. There was a true disruption of the way we conceive of social change as a global community. And 
in the kind of merging of two things, the war, the post-war effort of reconstruction, and in the industrialization um, that was happening across the world, we started to look at social change as a new type of effort. And with this effort, a whole new way of funding and exchanging of resources started to occur, which now drives, whether we know it or not, the way we do social change today. And much of the way we talk about social change and the way we approach social change has particularly in the last 40 years become extremely technical. So oftentimes we talk in terms of these outputs and outcomes, and these are very technical approaches. And although that has allowed us to make an enormous amount of progress as a globe in terms of our global goals, what we believe that, that has happened is that we've lost oftentimes the relational efforts of social change that are crucial to ensuring that social change is good for all of us. Um, so the book goes into this in detail. We're not going to spend a lot of time on it, but what I wanna emphasize is that when we talk about social change, we're often using terms and ways of thinking that are really quite new. They're relatively new. They've just been coming about in the last few decades. So we always have to interrogate and, and, and critique that and decide if that works for us as organizations and as leaders of organizations. The other thing that we kind of dissect is what, why are social challenges so difficult to grapple with? And this isn't going to come as news to, to anyone in this room. We know that there is complexity in the work that we do, huge complexity. And we also understand that the problems that we work with are extremely big. Um, so we oftentimes move towards this large scale effort to try and ensure that our solutions can be scaled to more and more populations. The area that we think um, we all understand intuitively, but that we, that we find more difficult to grapple with is the depth of social change issues, of social challenges. And these are the issues that derive from the fact that all of our social challenges come from an historical record. So we cannot remove ourselves from the system that we are sitting within. So in order to kind of ground ourselves as a, in a conversation, we're gonna go through these three terms. And I'm going to just hand it over to Francois to talk about complexity. Trying to get myself off mute. There we go. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Cynthia. I, one one point to add here. Actually, Cynthia and I have worked and also taught together for uh, well almost a decade, um, uh, including several courses on on systems change. But this is the first time we're doing this one together, and actually uh, on on um, on Zoom. On Zoom, and she knows that I normally interrupt her, so this mute button is probably quite liberating for her. So. Um, I, I, I wanted to yeah, just jump in a little bit. I think the other reflection on the fact that we recognize we're doing this session with you, but there is this larger kind of systems change conversation that's been happening for quite some time, even, you know, certainly throughout and within Catalyst um, over the last couple of years. And certainly we go back and look at, you know, the emphasis of systems thinking on, uh, on this field, in particular on the social change field and what impact that's had. I think a lot of us have got to understand that um, we uh, know that problems are, are, are complex, right? And we've kind of brought this complexity mindset to thinking about change. And I think intuitively, um, uh, a lot of us know that the problems we've been working with are, are linked to so many other things, right? That often you work on one problem, you see how it's, interconnected or interdependent to something else. So when this kind of complexity and systems thinking um, uh, framing came to the social change, well, I think it was quite readily adopted because it gave us some language to talk about the challenges we see and that trying to do a straightforward um, program was never straightforward. Um, but I think what, what has been helpful is to think about why and what makes things complex um, and then uh, to think about you know, the different kinds of approaches we take towards the, the, the solutions we build. So if we can move on, Cynthia, thanks. Um, I, I, we'll, we'll come back to, I think, the, the, the different framing uh, across the, the com complexity uh, scale and depth, but we wanted to dive into, into complexity for a minute. Um, so can you move on? And so uh, Brenda Zimmerman, who was a, 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 um, a colleague of, of ours from, um, uh, Canada and was a close colleague of Francis Wesley, who we worked with for many years, 
uh, described as in one of the most kind of best metaphors around thinking around uh, simple, complicated, and complex uh, problems uh, and, and our approaches to them. And uh, she described uh, baking a cake uh, as a creation, you know, a, a relatively simple problem of, well, I, I want a cake, or I'm, I'm hungry, I feel like dessert, and what is the kind of approach we take to it? Um, so, but maybe, uh, Cynthia, if you can actually just go back for a minute and not show that, uh, what, what the answers are. I would love to hear from the group, uh, what do you need to make, to make a cake? So if you, you take yourself off mute and just shout, like, what, what would you need if, if I asked you for a recipe to make a cake? Sugar. Thanks. Flour. Oven. Flour. Oven. A recipe. A recipe. <laughs> Great. So we have some ingredients. Uh, time. That's time. Yeah, and then and then we the realize actually we need some it. equipment. Sorry, Asha. The person to make it. A person. That's pretty important. <laughs> uh, it's, it's interesting how we start with the the, the kind of ten tangible ingredients and then we realize oh we need some equipment and then we realize oh we need some more of these intangible things like time um, and then we need uh, some level of uh, expertise I mean maybe we can automate some cakes but at some point we need we need humans there to do that um, and, and I think now you can show the slides Cynthia thanks um, what what um, uh, Brenda Zimmerman showed was that the, the, the thing about all of the things you said is that you told me all of that. I could write that down into the recipe that Debbie said, the ingredients, the equipment, the time, uh, and some instructions about how to actually put that all together uh, and create a cake. And the, the outcome is probably quite likely, even with my baking skills, uh, you know, it might flop once or twice, but I could learn quite quickly, even if I had no previous baking experience. Uh, and it's something that's reproducible. So we could share that with someone so this is, you know, thinking about what what makes simple approaches to relatively simple problems. That there is a there is a clear recipe to follow. It is reproducible. There are not that many variables. Um, doesn't require a huge amount of expertise, and likely, you know, we can get to the outcome and we can reproduce it. So now uh, she she took this metaphor and said, okay, that's a a, a relatively you know simple solution to a simple problem. If, uh, don't move the slides, Cynthia, but, but I'm gonna ask the, the group now, how do we send a rocket to the moon? If you can, again, just shout out, uh, uh, what, are the, what are the ingredients uh, we might need to send uh, a rocket to the moon? I wanna create a, you know, a space program and I wanna send uh, a rocket and some people to the moon. What, what do we need? Scientists, research, resources, money. imagination, resources, money, minerals, yes, this is money. Ambitious, talents, resources, curiosity, wow. uh, passion uh, and dedication, dream, space for making mistakes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, some some testing. Yeah, I'm going to take that as testing. Uh, that was great. Did, I, I I didn't hear Wrong everyone materials. just came at the same time. Uh, did anyone say some engineers? Yeah. Yes, mathematicians, yeah. Yeah, mathematicians, great. So we, we need yes. clearly a, a lot of expertise. We need um, some, you know, some quite a lot of um, equipment. And uh, I heard money said about three times. So clearly we need a lot of resources <laughs> um, as well as some, you know, imagination, creativity, some testing, um, you know, there are different weather patterns. We definitely need some modeling. We need to do some testing before we put humans in there. Clearly, we've seen some billionaires throw lots of money at this recently. Um, but if we if we if we put that whole recipe together, and Debbie asked was the one who said recipe last time, and we gave everything we said, uh, and said Debbie, please write that up into a space program so that you know we can also hand that over to a, let's say another country to start a space program. How big would that manual be? If our if our cake manual was maybe one page, how big would the space program manual be? Hundreds. <laughs> yeah, several Three books hundred, worth. Yeah. 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 Three hundred so, pages. <laughs> exactly. Um, Cynthia, we can move to the next slide. So, you know, so thinking about sending a rocket to the moon, we need this extensive manual of formula. It is potentially reproducible. We've seen other countries share with other countries their space programs, their expertise. It doesn't happen overnight, probably takes decades to do maybe high levels of expertise, lots of investment. 
the approach is to separate it into parts and, and coordinate and build it up, right? Some people working on the rocket fuel, some people working on design, some people working on the space station, some people working on the training, all of that. But it, so that's our approach to complicated problems. There are, you know, lots and lots and lots of variables, but if we follow the instructions, we are able to reproduce it. We're actually able to make it work. Uh, and, it, you know, we've seen that happen. Yes, with failures along the way. And yes, there are variables. But actually, um, if you follow a similar recipe, you are likely to eventually succeed. So, you know, we know, and we've seen like medical science do this, right? And I'm a doctor. And so I kind of, we know this is how we've all... How we've approached the human body certainly for the last hundred years let's divide up you know the kidney and then break down into all the super specialties of what people do to fix kidney problems um and we know that that has taken us really far um but at some point it doesn't help us with maybe complex our approaches to complex problems and this was the genius of brenda zimmerman she said okay well baking a cake uh, sending a rocket to the moon what is the example of a, of a complex problem and that was raising a child so this is the example she gave. Some of you may know this. It's quite a famous uh, one. Uh, but maybe don't show them the, 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 the answers, uh, Cynthia. <laughs> we can stay on, on the previous one with a rocket. But maybe um, if you can all tell me what it takes to raise a child. Forget about Patience. the Patience. investment of time. Investment Patience. of time. Lots of unconditional love. Uh, <laughs> Ani. Uh, more money. <laughs> what else? Lifetime creativity, of work. adaptability. Lifetime of work, adaptability and creativity. Yeah. Patience. More patience. <laughs> Capacity to inspire. Mm. Take of all trades. Ability to solve all the problems uh, that comes up anytime, anywhere. Mm. Love. Making your own manual as you go. Making your own manual as you go. Is that what you said? Yeah. Yes. Like Resilience. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, if we can go to the slide now, Cynthia, thanks so much. Um, there's something specific, right? There is no one book on parenting. If you go into any bookshop, how many books on parenting are there? Right. And, <laughs> and which is the one you choose? The one that affirms what your pre-existing ideas are, right? So it no one of them is going to help you and why you know, it says and, and the other interesting thing is once you have a second child like I do is you know the, the things you tried with the first one uh, doesn't necessarily guarantee you success with the second one it's not like baking another cake or sending another rocket to the moon uh, and so while there's lots of research and lots of expertise um, it's helpful but it's not sufficient to actually tell you to how to raise that child in front of you um, and I think a lot of you mentioned love uh, and connection um, and that relationships are key to all of this, but also the outcome is unknown. You know, to some degree, we don't know what's really going to happen until 20, 30 years later, in terms of what that outcome is, whatever our grand ideals are. And, and many of you spoke about the ability to, to steward, to share, to love, to uh, adapt and, and be creative and allow that journey to almost have its own path and that the role of a parent is something quite different. That's, that's what I heard. So... What, what is interesting, and so this is a different take on giving you an academic discussion on what complexity is, but complexity is about uh, individual nodes and the relationships and dynamics between them. And so what happens in, in a family uh, is that, you know, each person is unique, right? And each relationship is unique. Uh, and then you put a third person in there that might be a child or a fourth person and there might be another child or they're an uncle and a modern family, you know, no single uh, family dynamic will ever be the same. And so therefore there is a degree of complexity that is just way beyond uh, any approach that is kind of quite linear or quite structured that will uh, succeed. So we, we just have to accept that the nature of complexity is that it is relationship based. You can't isolate the parts and work on one side without necessarily working on the other and break it down. Um, and they, there is lots of disagreement. And so, you know, certainly if you share a parenting role with anyone else or a uh, you know, there's lots of disagreement. And that's the same with complex problems. There, there aren't agreed ways of how we solve poverty. There aren't agreed ways of how we uh, raise children. And so with the really complex problems, which is most of the social challenges we deal with, there is disagreement and there isn't necessarily a point where we get to, we've landed on the moon. 
Uh, so there is no endpoint to these. And that each situation is unique and context you know, hugely matters. Uh, and that in a way, um, there are not solutions that are right or wrong or true and false, but those that are better and, and less better in many ways. Um, and so that it's a continual process in a way. And so while that can sometimes seem a bit overwhelming and out of our control, the other amazing thing is that, you know, as, as human beings, we've evolved and we've been raising children for tens of thousands of years. And so there's also something we need to trust in ourselves, in our innate ability of, uh, of, of being relational. Uh, and I think this is coming back to what, what Cynthia spoke about. At some point, we forgot, right, that uh, in our approach to try and solve everything with an industrial mindset, that how important um, uh, our relational skills are. So um, I will uh, just maybe pause there for a moment and see, Cynthia, if you want to jump in with uh, any additional thoughts or reflections on that. No, just to say that um, in the in the recent um, months, we have added in a fourth type of problem, which if you know a framework called the Kinefin framework, um, there's also a fourth type of problem and that's a chaotic one. So you might've seen the slide as we scrolled through about chaotic problems and they offer different features as well. And we've been through just in the last year and a half, um, quite a, a journey of a complex issue becoming chaotic and now returning to a complex one. Um, so oftentimes in a chaotic situation, you have to just act and learn, but in a, it, it then will return to a complex situa situation that you have to deal with in these sorts of ways, in these relational ways um, that offer a multitude of solutions, which requires us to learn together. I'm just, Francois, I'm gonna move ahead because I don't want to sure. shortchange any of our conversations together. Um, so, so this was the first piece that we really dissected in the book, trying to understand the complexity of social issues. I think we live this. So for us, none of this is news. It's putting language to the things that we feel and that we sense every day in the work that we are doing. But the other piece that we wanted to look at was this issue of scale. So this word scale, we all know, has become ubiquitous in our conversations about social change. It almost has become a religion or a dogma that whatever you do must be scaled in order to be um, acceptable or in order to be fundable. And so this issue of scale has really weighed upon, I think, social change organizations as they have progressed in these last decades um, to achieve what they want to achieve. But I think what we wanted to do was kind of look at that word again and kind of take back from from the business world, what is a term that refers to efficiency and look at it and think about it in terms of social change. Does that term serve us? Does that concept serve us? And really the term large scale is just about how problems become bigger as we see them across different geographies and different populations. But with wicked problems, which is what we're talking about, complex problems um, that have adaptation as they go, there are really no stopping point. So this had this idea of scale is different than in an, in an industrial model where you're trying to increase throughput in a system. So we started to look at the word scale and think about it in two different ways, kind of scale versus scale. So there's this scale efficiency term that we use in the business world and increasingly in the social change world to mean you wanna put more people in many cases through the system at a, at a more efficient rate. But actually scale in the mathematical term just refers to how a system changes when you change the size of it. So when we saw that and when we did some research and reading into it, we realized that by using this term and always thinking about the efficiency um, side of things, we were missing the fact that the change in size of a system doesn't always happen in the same way in a factory as it does in societies. And in fact, there is a physicist named um, Jeffrey West who wrote a whole book on scale. And he said that we don't really fully understand how scaling works in complex adaptive systems, in cities, in societies. And so by trying to treat them like we would a factory, we're actually doing a disservice because we don't always understand what's going to happen if we try and just marginally put more throughput in the system. So we really tried to look at scale differently um, as we were looking at organizations and think about how could we approach scale in a way that's not industrial, that's not factory based. And then the third piece is this issue of depth. And I think this is the one that we really feel in the day-to-day -day work. Certainly Francois and I in the, in the context of South Africa and the organizations that we were looking 
at and spending time with and really um, getting deeply into their work, we realized that this issue of depth is a daily issue that is being grappled with. And really what we mean by depth is just that is just what the, that is, that beliefs and values and assumptions are the qualities that are extraordinarily difficult to change. And that in fact, our ability to change systems, they fail when we have these behaviors entrenched to the extent that we cannot just change, but we can't even imagine what change could look like. Um, we have a preconceived idea of what change could look like because of the beliefs that we hold. And in this case, we had to really learn to look introspectively at ourselves and, and think about ourselves in the system. Oftentimes we think of systems change and we imagine ourselves as scientists in the lab and we're just kind of manipulating variables. We map things on whiteboards and we use lots of sticky notes and we think, oh gosh, if we can intervene here, if we can do this, then we can change the system. But in fact, we are the system. We are the people who make up the systems that we seek to change. And in the work that we are doing, particularly as social change makers, we are often participating in them and maintaining them just by doing the work that we are doing. And that really caused us to, to pause and take a deeper look at what these organizations were doing to shift these things in ways that were far more participatory, far more people-centered and far more power configuring than what we had seen when we looked at it solely with the complexity and scale lenses. Okay, on that, I think that's a good point for us to start to look at a case study um, because we really wanna take this from the theoretical and start to really ground this in, in the work of organizations that we spent a really um, significant amount of time with. Francois, do you wanna take it over from here and, and share about our labs? Yeah, thanks so much. Um, so our labs is an organization that I've worked with for 10 years. Um, we had a... Um, in a way, I, I actually at the university I actually proposed at some point for them to become faculty of the university as as an organization. We ended up learning, I think, so much more from them uh, in social relation than than we ever taught. So I, it's really always a privilege to be able to tell their story. Um, and what I'm going to do is um, tell you a bit about, about them, show a short video, uh, and then we're going to unpack. I think it's you know often uh, what we've been finding in this work. Um, is that the, the, the story that is normally told about the organization uh, is often missing uh, the, the, the deeper sets of practices that, that we've tried to surface in this book that we think is what we should actually be talking about and focusing on when we're talking about this change. So uh, our labs is an organization that grew out of an area uh, just outside of Cape Town uh, that is quite affected by gangs where uh, the gangs um, uh, essentially control the area where um, drugs are, are one of the few means of uh, any income uh, and where youth unemployment and uh, dropout from school is over 60 percent uh, and so i mean some of you who know south africa know that that context and there are other similar uh, places in the world uh, and it's clear that you know the that, that gangs and drugs are a complex problem for many uh, societies around the world and the traditional and often, you know, uh, approaches we've seen from governments is, you know, put in the military, put in the army, uh, try to cut down, um, uh, you know, look at this as a, from, from a criminal perspective. And I think our labs grew out of uh, and came from a number of uh, leaders actually within the gangs who made a commitment to change uh, and together with uh, initially a, a church group, um, sat around the table and 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 said, "What should you know? What 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 is the future? Not only for us, but what is the future for our younger siblings? What is the future for our children?" Uh, and what what's been incredible about our labs is that it's been driven by uh, initially in its leadership uh, a number of people from the gangs and, and who were involved in in the drug trade. They now, you know, are in 20 countries in the world. They're the largest employer in um, in Bridgetown and Manenberg, where they're from. Um, and on the surface, look like a company that essentially um, they're a social enterprise. They're a hybrid, non-profit, for-profit, uh, and they essentially uh, run uh, an incubator, uh, IT training programs um, for young people, for elderly people. 
uh, and uh, have created and trained um, more than 20,000 people uh, in, in these skills, created 90,000 job opportunities and uh, led to more than 1,500 businesses being started. So in, in I, and I've given you the story in the way we normally talk about uh, social change and how we normally talk about um, uh, outcomes for organizations that do training for youth or computer training for youth. But there was something definitely happening under the surface in this place that you could feel when you went there uh, and that has really contributed to, um, I think, far more long lasting changes in people's lives than I think uh, the, than those statistics will tell you. So with that as a backdrop, I'm going to show a short video uh, because it will also root us a little bit in the context of, of our labs. Um, and I hopefully will do this correctly um, and share the sound as well. Here we go. Suzanne Smith and this is basically my house where I live. In this house we used to sell drugs. We, we used to keep a lot of people's guns in this house. We were part of the American gangs because we sold drugs for them and this is where my life, where my life was dark in the darkness because I, I used to run around with the gangs with the guns. We used to go to court even with the guns and um, I have two children, two boys. I, I come, I come out of an abusive relationship with my boyfriend that um, forced me into using drugs. I couldn't go to school. As I was on my way to school, people used to follow us. They used to shoot at us on my way to school, and we used to stay in in the in our in the in the house for like weeks or months because we couldn't go out. If we were if we went out, people would like shoot on us because we were part of a gang and we lived here as a family with the gangs in this house of us this people used to come here they used to sleep here the gangs and everything was just happening here in this small shack of us and that is where my life i thought my life was going to end at that time Hi, my name is Angelo. As a young child, I was molested by an older family member, and this led to sexual and gender confusion. But what made things worse was that I never had a relationship with my father, and in my teen years, my parents got divorced and that shattered my world. I became very rebellious. I dropped out of school and I ran away from home. I ended up on the streets of Cape Town prostituting and impersonating the lifestyle of a woman. These are the streets that I used to roam at night in search for drugs, alcohol and just prostituting. I needed something to take the pain away and the drugs and the alcohol at the time seemed to do the best job. This lifestyle I lived for quite a while and because I didn't have much of an education and had literacy problems, I couldn't find work easily. And I just continued living this lifestyle for quite a while. I then eventually ended up in hospital almost dead because my body couldn't handle the chemicals of the drugs I was using anymore. In a world where change is not always inevitable, a world where hope seems to have been lost, a world where poverty has a monopoly, the one thing that we know that can transform this world is when people start having hope. And that's exactly what Art Labs is about. It's a movement of hope. It's a movement by people, for people. It's a movement of learning, of empowering, and it's a social revolution. The journey of Art Labs is all about seeing the transformation in the life of one person, knowing that their story potentially can transform not just their life, but at the same time can actually leave a legacy in their communities. We believe at Art Labs that education is so vital and important that it's a tool that can really begin to transform our communities. And therefore, we've committed ourselves to investing in education, investing in people, because we believe that it's through that investment that we'll see hope beginning to rise in the lives of individuals. I used to 
used to talk when I used to be at home. I used to talk about guns and smoking and stuff. Nowadays, when I come home from work, from RFs, all I talk to them about is technology. I became a co-facilitator at R Labs and that's where everything's changed for me and I asked myself, why can these people ask me to be a co-facilitator? Are they crazy? And Monique and Rene still told me, Suzanne, we believe in you that you can do it. I'm facilitating over 50 people and I'm just loving it. And I also do the admin of R Labs and being in the space has changed my life a lot. And I've recently also wrote my metric exams. I see life differently now. I don't look at my circumstances anymore. Even though I live in a shack, I know that in two years' time, I will be a businesswoman and I will have my own business. And that will be all thanks to artists for what they have done and implanted in me. Olives really gave me hope and the opportunity to educate myself. I started educating myself. I also completed my matric and I'm currently the academy manager at R Labs. R Labs is really a place of hope. And I think if our labs could have done it for me, how much more can they do it for people out there that are hopeless and that are feeling hurt and that are feeling pain and that wants to change their life around. At our labs, we believe there should be no barriers to learning, no barriers to education. And that is what this revolution is all about. It is about the removal of barriers. It's about hope transcending these barriers and having each and every person being able to have access to education. So why don't you join this revolution? This movement of change, this movement of hope, this movement where we can see our communities being transformed. Thanks, it gives you a, a, a bit of a context of what the reality of um, actually many, many, many young people in, in South Africa face and around the world. Um, so those are actually all actually dear friends of mine now it's been it's been a long journey walking with them uh, and what i wanted to just quickly unpack and cynthia you can show show the slide thank you so much is what was going on below the surface here so you got a bit of the context you know two individuals journeys and something about transcending barriers right and i, and I think we're in a world now because of covid we've also seen that we talk about systemic barriers and we've seen how systemic and structural barriers has been you know a real obstacle uh, and that the people who have um, who face these barriers have been directly affected, both in health and economic terms, from 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 those barriers that are in place that, that the world has put in place. Um, and and so it, it is not as simple as you know here is an IT certificate, good luck in the world. There is something happening here uh, over and above the technology training that was actually far more powerful than technology training. And the, the principle that, that we speak about uh, and, and the book really uncovers three principles across you know, many, many organizations. And one that was really common and extremely powerful was this idea of fostering connection. And many of you work with it in different ways through peer groups uh, and, and connecting and, and creating some kinds of uh, common identities across different groups and different people uh, that actually helps to build movements that helps to build this revolution that Marlon Parker in the video was talking about, but that actually helped uh, these young people um, to, to create you know, the, 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 the space and identity to be able to believe in themselves, right? And so essentially, if you look at how they structure their courses, how they actually set up, what they're really doing is building on what we call the, the, the practice of, you know, this practice of systems work here was, was in cultivating collectives. And how, again, we spoke about this relational component of complex problems. Youth unemployment is like a really complex problem. Drugs are a really complex problem. The way out of that is not necessarily give people just certificates in education or, you know, put them in prison for, for doing drugs. It's actually building identity, uh, building uh, collectives of, of strength. And so we, in the book, and we'll start to talk about this, you'll see some of the structure we have, which is what is the principle that underlies what the organizations are doing? What are the different kinds of practices that actually build that principle that's quite pragmatic? And also what are the tactics, uh, the day-to-day -day work that they're doing in building this common identity, building a we, we call it, creating safe havens and places where young people can come to um, after years of 
feeling uh, of failure, but actually have spaces of hope, but actually be able to put their dreams on the table and feel like that's actually a possibility, seeing others go through that same uh, process, learning from others and that, but also seeing that our labs itself was not run by outsiders with real expertise. It was actually run by people who have been in the same shoes that they have been and sometimes in even kind of more difficult shoes uh, and, and have been able to grow beyond that. Uh, and then there's also a sharing and pooling of experiences that people come together and share, okay, well, this is the challenge I'm facing. This is how I've dealt with it. So you'll see, you know, these practices, you know, actually come a little bit from counseling. They come a bit from, um, from, from community organizing and have been built together. And, and ultimately, you know, and we'll share some of the materials with you, what we're calling the, the deep system changes. They're actually building systems of action that young people are doing things for themselves, but because they have these spaces, these resources, this mindset and identity um, that despite all of the structural and systemic barriers that lie in their path, there is a strength and resilience uh, in, in the collective that is extremely powerful. And that's built by you know, this highly relational work that our labs does. And what's been really interesting is to watch how they've done that also now in, in you know, 20 different countries in the world, sometimes more successfully than others, but, you know, who they identify to work with locally in doing that. I won't go too much into that part of the story, um, but Cynthia, maybe I'll hand over to you at this point. Thanks, Francois. I think what, what Francois has done is shown you how the book is structured with the case studies of trying to show an overarching principle and then dive deeper into the practices and the tactics that make that principle come alive. And what we're going to do just for the next um, couple of minutes is go through the three principles in the book. And then in the next module next week, we're going to dive into four different practices that come from those principles. So we'll be doing this again, where we'll be looking at the surface work of an organization, but then going deeper and figuring out what is it that actually drives the systemic change? What is the systems work that they are doing to shift those systems? But for the rest of today, what we really want to do is show you the principles. And then we want to spend some time independently um, working with those principles so that you can identify the systems work that you are already doing in your organization. And then we're gonna break out into groups to look more closely um, together. So I just wanna give you um, a brief overview of the principles, the three principles of systems work, and then we'll do some independent work. So the core question at the, at the key of these principles is who, is who should drive change? And one of the things that we really came away with when we were looking at each of these organizations was that they were all working predominantly with what we call primary actors. And these are the individuals and in the groups who are, who are living at the point of greatest complexity in the system. In fact, for those members of our labs, the work that they were doing didn't even seem complex because it was actually what they were doing on a day-to-day -day basis. And those are the individuals that have the greatest capacity to change a system because they are living in it every single day. And what we realized was that by changing the relationships between those individuals and increasing their capacity to drive their own change, these organizations were having systemic change in ways that kind of top-down organizations could not drive. So principle one, this is the one that our labs we think really um, um, is emblematic of and shows very well, which is this idea of fostering connection. But this isn't just connecting just anyone to anyone. This is about building collective identity amongst a group of primary actors. So in the case of our labs, the primary actors were those individuals living in, in Bridgetown, many of whom were involved in gangs, many of whom were involved in drugs, but by giving them places to be and come together in different ways, identities that had different attributes, they were able to shift the system of Bridgetown in a fundamentally and sustainable way. So this idea of fostering connection is really a simple thing, but it's very, very um, powerful, which is building collective identity so that groups can stay together while they're learning together. Many of your organizations already do this, but, the, but what we found was that it's not always lifted up as the true work of an organization. It's often being done in the background, being done as something that is really driving the change and driving the program or driving the solution, but isn't necessarily called out in the, um, in the funding proposals or in the marketing materials of a book, in the surface work that they're showing. The second principle that we found was this idea of embracing context. Um, and this can sound kind of um, also very simple. You know, what does it mean to embrace context? But really what we found was that organizations that try and drive a single solution in all cases 
oftentimes fail to achieve what they want to achieve because when it comes to it, context can shift what the solution is. So by, use, by using this idea of a plurality of solutions that programs will always necessarily adapt on the ground as they need to, then you start to see how primary actors can become the drivers of change because they're the ones that can truly adapt the program or the solution to the change that is needed. But ensuring that primary actors have that capacity is absolutely critical. The third principle is around reconfiguring of power. It's, it's no good if primary actors are given all of this responsibility, but not given the power to drive the change that they want to see in the world. Um, that's actually the piece that drives that depth um, um, issue that we were talking about. It's, it's no good to actually try and drive change if we're not shifting the power dynamics underlying that change. So ensuring that primary actors are able to sit in positions of decision-making in a sustainable and long-term way is the way that these changes become seeded and um, perpetuated over and over again. So these, these principles are, are, are threaded throughout the entire book. And what we'll talk about next week is around the the practices that can drive these principles. But we first wanted to give you an opportunity to work with the principles in this room together. So what we'd like to do um, is first take a few minutes to do some independent work. And really all you need is a sheet of paper or a laptop or whatever you'd like to, whatever you like to scribble on. Um, and we want you to think over the next, let's say five to six minutes about who are the primary actors in your organization? Who are the who are the actors that draw that are sitting at the point of greatest complexity in your system? And then go through the three principles. And again, these are just things that you can um, jot down and think about later as well. But how is your organization already fostering connection amongst these individuals and groups? What is that core work that you're doing to foster connection that wouldn't exist otherwise? And then how is your organization equipping those primary actors to be able to embrace their context? in new and different ways. And then lastly, is your organization reconfiguring power? Is it driving points of decision-making towards these primary actors? Probably so, if so, how? And what we'd like you to do is just jot down for a few minutes, for about five minutes and think about that. We're also going to do a Zoom link shift right now. Um, so we're gonna come out of our Zoom room and then come back into a different Zoom room. And the reason why we're going to do that is so that we can um, get into breakout groups. Um, Debbie, do you want to just tell us where they can go to do that Zoom room? Yes. So we're going to go back into this Zoom link that, it's we, 11 that we had to get in originally. And um, it's a technical glitch that we had. We didn't have the breakout room set up. So we're going to all leave together and then we're all going to come right back into the link. Um, so this is the same link, link, Zoom link that we had before. And Julia, do you have it available or do I have to grab it? And don't, let's not lose you. This is where we're gonna get into breakout groups. So as you're doing your independent work, just go out and come straight back in. We don't wanna lose you. Yes, so I'm going to put the link in the chat and then all of us, uh, you'll go, like I said, if you could just make sure you grab that link and come back in, thank you. Then we will make sure that we get back in while you're doing your individual works. So click on the link now and we'll close this group and come back in. Same exact. Well, welcome back. Um, good, Cynthia, you're here. Yes, I think Francois and I had a chance to pop into all of the groups and it was wonderful to hear the conversations that were happening. Um, I was just really thrilled to be able to join a few of them just really briefly. So thank you for that. And thank you for everyone's real um, participation in those conversations. I really felt that there was quite a lot of sharing going on even though we had just a short amount of time. And that will serve us well as we head into kind of our next, um, our next modules. I just want to check, Debbie, is everyone back now? Or are we, and are we, should we just go ahead and uh, finish wrapping up? We've got everybody back in. Okay, wonderful. Can I have one reflection, uh, maybe Cynthia as well, before we, we do the wrap up? Um, I'm taking that your silence as a yes. 
<laughs> since she's used to me interrupting. Uh, well, these breakout groups keep popping up for me. I'm not sure for for everyone. Um, well, yeah, I was I asked to I join have... another group as well. Yeah. So I think just that ignore mistake? that. Just ignore that. Ignore them. Sorry. Yeah, they're just popping up. Um, my, my, it was just thanks for the groups that uh, allowed me to join in and, and, and join some of the conversation. Uh, in some ways, particularly when, since we spoke about you know, one of these first uh, principles on connection, um, it felt like a lot of that work was already happening. I think some of the feedback we've we've got has been how this is affirming a lot of the practices that are already happening in organizations that perhaps you know donors don't necessarily want to talk about or where actually it's difficult to invest resources in you know things like forming peer groups and circles and youth circles and 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 i wanted to connect that to how kind of powerful and how important that is in the systems change conversation because sometimes we can get disconnected and think okay this is back to doing kind of micro grassroots work and how critical this this piece is and obviously it builds on asset-based community development and rtsn capability thinking we're not necessarily talking about new work here we're talking about really important work that we mustn't forget uh, about how central that is to doing this deeper transformative change um, and that in in certainly in the groups that i heard uh, and obviously in the case of, of our labs this idea of um of really fostering connection between people and the building of relationships uh, is part and parcel of these longer, bigger term shifts around these quite complex challenges. And so I wanna also connect the, the kind of micro bits of the day to day, and that's actually the whole purpose of this conversation with you all to the larger arcs of change around, you know, uh, youth empowerment, youth employment, whatever the, the context is that you might be working in. Uh, and so, uh, it's it's almost an affirmation and also encouraging to kind of hear some of the things that I already heard when people saying, okay, if I look at it in this way, this is what it is. So thank you for, for sharing that. And I just wanted to add, um, I had some really interesting conversations as well. And one of the groups that I was in, um, you know, we, we were talking about the, the what, what's problems. You know, we, we've been talking a lot about problems this morning and how in fact problems are not necessarily the way we want to center things and, and our approaches. Um, you know, what, what it occurred to me was that um, in fact, the work that we do, they aren't problems. It's our privilege to be able to do this work. It's our, um, in fact, the work that we do is an opportunity. So, so the conversation that we've had this morning about problems is, is a framing, um, but it's a way for us to get more deeply into the conversation together. Um, let's not situate ourselves too much in problems. Let's move ahead into the work that, that, that you are all doing. Um, and like Francois said, this is an affirmation of much of the work that you are already doing, a way to put language on it and ensure that um, others recognize it as the work of systems change. Um, I, wa I want, um, Francois, should we, I'm, I'm, I'm conscious of time. We don't, we know everyone's time is ex it's extremely valuable. So we want to go ahead and wrap up when we, when we said we would wrap up. Um, but we just wanted to give you some highlights for the, the modules to come. Um, really what we've done today is a taster of, the, of what's to come. So we're, we spent time today on the very uh, big picture, which was the industry of social change and these principles of systems work. Um, but really in the next module, we're gonna go deeply into the practices. So the practices in the book are four practices that stem out of these principles. And we're gonna be spending time together unpacking those practices in the work that you do and in the work of the case study organizations that are highlighted in the book. And then in the third module, we're really going to take it again out a bit and look at the funding and the measurement pieces. So what are the things that support uh, this systems work and how can we start to shift those conversations? So I think we called it rallying our supporting actors. It's about ensuring that those who support the work that you do with primary actors gets the full support of those who are funding and measuring the work that you are doing. Um, so that's kind of just a, a bit of an overview of what's to come. Um, we want to ensure that you have all the readings that you need. So if you are trouble, have any trouble accessing any of it, please let us know and we'll get those um, readings out to you. And I think um, today went very quickly, but I hope that you all got a chance to connect with each other and spend some time with the material. And we'll have more of that in the weeks to come. If everyone could just turn on their cameras and turn on their voices and just say goodbye. It's always nice to hear everyone's voices as we leave the room.
Thank you so much. Bye. 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 Bye.